God is good. And all the time, amen. It's good to sing Christmas songs, but I don't have a Christmas message today. Actually, this is the final message in our mini series on the eight things every, or eight theological terms every Christian should know. Do you remember what the other seven are? I don't see any hands going up. We, uh, we talked about the omnis, omniscience, omnipotence, omnipresence. Then we talked about general revelation, what God reveals to everybody generally. We talked about special revelation, the revelation that comes through the Holy Spirit. We talked about justification, and I'll give you the kitty definition, just as if I'd never sinned. Sanctification, set apart from the world, set apart to God. And uh, today, the last term is glorification, hence the title of today's message, The Hope of Glory. You know, all of us hope for something. What are you hoping for today? Maybe you're hoping for something simple like good weather. Maybe you're hoping I don't preach too long today because you're already ready for lunch. Your stomach's growling. (laughs) Somebody said amen to that. Maybe your hope is more significant than that. Maybe you're hoping for an end to this pandemic so you can take off your mask. Maybe you're hoping that your medical tests come back negative. Maybe you need a job. Maybe you're hoping for a job. Or if you got a job, maybe you're hoping for a raise or a promotion. Or maybe you're hoping for a friend or family member to get saved. All of us have hopes. God is hardwired us that way. You know, you look at animals, and they they live by pure instinct. But we humans, we project out our lives into the future, and we hope for things to be the way we want them to be. And so I want to go to Romans chapter 8 today because this passage is all about hope as well. Picking up in verse 18, the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Rome, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption, and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now, hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. We who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we await eagerly the redemption of these physical bodies. And the older we get the more we yearn for the redemption of these old mortal bodies. Amen? You young people don't know what I'm talking about. But us old heads, we do. (laughs) I want to point out just three things from uh, the scriptures today about the hope of glory. The first thing is that your present suffering means future glory. Your present suffering means future glory. The sufferings of this present time are not even worth comparing to the glory that's going to be revealed in us. That's what the scripture says. In other words, the pain and the suffering that you endure in this life is going to seem like nothing when compared to the glory that every child of God will experience in eternity. The Apostle Paul, he makes this same point in the book of Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. He says, therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we're wasting away. Amen. 
Outwardly, we're wasting away. But inwardly, we're being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Think about who wrote this and the stuff that he went through. The man was beaten and shipwrecked and stoned and left for dead and imprisoned. And he says, yeah, these are just light and momentary afflictions. They're achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs all that stuff. So we fix our eyes on what, not what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. When you have the hope of glory, it makes suffering on earth tolerable. Amen? All of this stuff we go through is only temporary. Only lasts for a little while. But eternal glory awaits those who are true believers in Jesus Christ. So let's go back to our text in Romans 8. and Look at verse 19. It says, For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. In other words, what our glorified bodies will be like has not yet been revealed. All that we know is that our bodies are going to be like the body that Jesus had when he rose from the dead. Think about that for a moment. He was buried in a tomb, and they placed a big rock over it and sealed that. But the sealed tomb couldn't hold him. The angel didn't move the stone so he could come out. The angel moved the stone so people could look in and see he was gone. He was already gone. Locked doors were meaningless to him. Remember, the disciples were locked away in the upper room because they were scared to death. And boom, shakalaka, Jesus just appears out of nowhere. He could disappear and he could appear. Yet he had a body that could eat, a body that you could touch. You could feel the holes in his hand and the wounds in his side. He had a body that could ascend into heaven. That's that glorified body. Right now, we're weak. Right now, we're wasting away. Right now, we are imperfect. But one day, we're going to be just like Jesus. Amen? And creation eagerly awaits that day. I love the way Paul personifies creation here. All the flowers, all the trees, all the, the grass and the clouds and the lakes and the animals and the sun and the moon and the stars, all of creation eagerly awaits that day when we will have glorified bodies because the curse will be lifted. Amen? Notice what Paul writes about creation in verses 20 and 21. He says, For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Who subjected creation to futility? Well, of course God did. Creation was perfect. When God created everything in the book of Genesis, everything was perfect, but then God brought it all under a curse when Adam sinned. That's why we have so many natural disasters in this world. That's why we have so many diseases, pandemics. That's why there's death on the earth. It's all part of the curse. And creation, even creation, hopes to be set free from its bondage to corruption one day. You can look around outside and you see all those bare trees and they're waiting with eager longing for the warmth and the brightness of spring. God subjected those trees to the futility of leaflessness, but he did so with the hope of spring. And springtime is an annual reminder for us not to lose heart because one day an eternal spring will come. Amen. Every born-again believer is going to receive glorified bodies, and all of creation will inherit its glory as well. All of creation will share in our future glory one day. So keep that in mind. Your present suffering means future glory. One other thing I want to share with you this morning is that there is a truth that we need to learn about this present age, the truth about the present age. Going back to Romans 8, 22 through 23, 
For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. As long as this present age lasts, we're going to continue to groan under the burden of unredeemed bodies. We get tired. Amen? My, I remember my grandma, she used to always say, I'm so tired. I am so tired. And I'm like, okay, whatever, grandma. <laughs> but you know, I understand now, being a grandfather myself, I understand what she was talking about. We get tired, amen? We get fatigued. We get sick and we get discouraged. But we have the first fruits of the Spirit. And still we groan inwardly as we await eagerly our adoption as sons, the redemption of these bodies. But we have the Holy Spirit. Amen? The Holy Spirit indwells us. The Holy Spirit is our, our guarantee of redemption. The Holy Spirit is our earnest, our, our down payment, the deposit for our redemption. He doesn't take away all the pain and suffering and frustration in this life. But on the contrary, he is the spirit of hope. The spirit of hope. Going to verses 24 and 25, Paul says, For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what they sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. We wait for it with patience, and patience is a fruit of the Spirit, amen? amen? Love, joy, peace, patience. Patience is a fruit of the Spirit, and we know that patience is the fruit of hope. And so the Holy Spirit inspires us with hope while we groan and while we wait our glorification. The indwelling Holy Spirit will give you the patience that you need to endure to the end by reminding you that this present suffering is nothing compared to the future glory that awaits us in eternity. One other thing I want to point out is the hope of redeemed bodies. The hope of redeemed bodies. There's coming a day when your physical body will be redeemed and there'll be no more groaning. There will be no more waiting. There will be no more sin, no more sadness, no more sickness, no more suffering. That's a great thought. That's a wonderful thought. But don't make that the center of your hope because God wants to be the center of your hope. Amen? Anybody here ever wondered why God gave us bodies in the first place? I mean, think about it. He could have just made us spirit beings like the angels. But he didn't. He gave us bodies. And once you figure out why he gave us bodies, then you'll understand why he intends to redeem these bodies. So I want to look at a few verses and see what the scriptures have to say about the body. 1 Corinthians 6.13 is the first one. Notice what he says here. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Wow. That should make us more determined to flee sexual sin. Amen? Our bodies are for the Lord and the Lord for the body. We exist not only in spirit and souls, but also in our bodies for God. So what does all that mean? Well, let's skip down a couple of verses to verses 19 and 20 of that same chapter. Paul says, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Think about that. You were created in your mother's womb, but now you have been purchased spirit, soul, and body through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ in order to be a dwelling place for the Holy Spirit and in order to display the glory of God. Amen? That's one reason why we have bodies. Paul even gives us a specific 
illustration from his own experience. Here he was in prison when he wrote the book of Philippians, facing the prospect of torture, beheading, and death. And look at what he says in Philippians 1.20. As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage now, as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. So one reason you have a body is so that Christ may be honored in your body and so that God may be glorified. Your body is like a tool to work for God's purposes or, or like a weapon intended to fight for God's causes. Everybody's familiar with Romans 12.1, right? Let's go there. Paul said, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So here, your body's pictured as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which you present to him as an act of spiritual worship. So another reason that we have these bodies is so that we can use them to worship God and we may not be able to do it in, in ways otherwise. Romans 6.13 says this, Do not present your members to sin as instruments, of, uh, instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourself to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. God is so zealous to display his glory that he conceived of a whole dimension of reality that didn't even exist before he created the material world. He created it and he put us in it right here on planet earth with physical bodies to create more possible ways in which his righteousness could be shown and enjoyed by his creatures. Now let's go back to Romans 8 and see whether we should set our hopes on redeemed bodies. Picking up in verse 23, and not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope for who hopes for what they seize. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. So God is teaching us to hope for the redemption of our bodies. So there's nothing wrong with hating pain. I don't like pain. Pain hurts. There's nothing wrong with hating misery and suffering. That's not the way God intended things to be from the beginning. Remember, he created everything perfect. He said it was all very good. Amen. It's all right to want to be free from a wheelchair or, or from insulin or having to take pain medicine. There's nothing wrong with wanting perfect hearing and eyesight. God is promising you a new body, a redeemed body, a glorified body when glory replaces groaning. Amen? And at that point, all sin will be gone. All evil will be gone which means no more disease, no more disabilities, no more uh, deformities, no more death. Because in a mysterious and wonderful way, God is going to give you a brand new glorified body, which is going to be perfect. And you'll have that perfect look, that perfect body you've always wanted. So yes, you should set your hopes on a redeemed body, but keep God at the center of your hopes. Amen. And the beauty of it is all of creation is going to be redeemed as well. Not just us, but all of creation. God is making a new heaven and a new earth where we will live with him, where peace and righteousness dwells. People often wonder what the new heaven and the new earth is going to be like. Well, think about your car. Most of us drive older cars, right? But if you get a new one, it's going to be just like the old one. Only is it going to be new. It's going to be better. Everything's going to work perfectly. At least so you get a few thousand miles on it, right? The new heaven and the new earth is going to be like the old one, only better. Everything's going to be perfect. Your old body is going to be made new in the resurrection. As it says in 1 Corinthians, mortality will put on immortality. Amen. 
Colossians chapter 1, verse 27 says, Christ in you is the hope of glory. Christ in you is the hope of glory. In other words, because of Jesus' death and burial and resurrection, because you have given him control of your life, you are born again and you have the hope of glorious things to come. The hope of glory is the final fulfillment of God's promise of glorification. Amen? Going back to Romans 8, verse 11, look at what he says here. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Like Jesus said, a, a grain of wheat has to fall into the earth and die before it becomes alive. That seed you plant in the ground, that corn you, set, or you plant in the ground, that wheat, that bean you plant in the ground, it dies and then it comes up with new life. And that's the way it's going to be with us. These old bodies are going to be sown in the ground. But God's going to resurrect and we'll have new bodies, new life. And we'll live in a new heaven and a new earth. And we'll have a heavenly inheritance. Think about the inheritance we're going to have. First Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. You are an heir of God. You are a joint heir with Jesus Christ. We are heirs to an imperishable, undefiled, unfading inheritance that awaits us in heaven. Christ in you is the hope of glory. Amen? And you can know beyond the shadow of a doubt that beyond this earthly existence, there is a life awaiting us that is glorious beyond all imagination if Jesus is your Lord and Savior. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 10 and 11. Let me encourage you with this passage. Peter says, After you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. God is going to call you to eternal glory. When Jesus is Lord, suffering gives way to glory. Amen. Without Jesus, suffering and torment is just going to continue and even get worse in eternity. But for true believers, you have been adopted into the family of God. But you know what? Your adoption is not yet complete. You have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, but your redemption is not yet complete. You have been saved from eternal punishment, but your salvation is not yet complete. Romans 8, 29 says, You are predestined to be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. And then he goes on in the next verse and he says, those who he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Amen. Amen. One day, God has promised he's going to finish the work he started in us. And it's going to happen when we see Jesus face to face. We'll be glorified just as he promised. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Because you first loved us. You have just a, a magnificent plan for our lives. And we thank you for the plan of salvation that was formulated in eternity past. Thank you, Jesus, for volunteering to carry out that salvation plan. Willingly. We know you didn't have to do it, but you did it out of love for us because there was no other way for us to be redeemed. And so, Lord Jesus, we thank you for your death and burial and resurrection. Thank you for justifying us, sanctifying us, 
redeeming us. And we thank you for the promise of glorifying us. We look forward to that day when we will be with you forever. Where peace and righteousness dwells. When there's no more sin or sadness or suffering. No more death. No more evil. We look forward to that. But Lord, there's still breath in our bodies. You're not finished with us yet. There's still more for us to do. I pray that today we would be encouraged with the hope of future redemption, future salvation, perfect sanctification, perfect glorification. But in the meantime, that we would be faithful to live for you and be faithful witnesses for you. And Father, I realize that not everybody listening today has been saved. Not everybody knows Jesus. And I pray that as your word has gone forth today, it would accomplish what you sent it to do. If there's somebody listening today, maybe here or online, and they've never committed their lives to Jesus, today's the day of salvation. Don't harden your heart. Ask God to forgive you of your sins. Tell him you're, you're tired of running your own life and you're ready to turn from that old way of life and turn to him to do as he wants you to do. Ask Jesus to save you. Ask Jesus to be Lord of your life. And he will. He promised that if, if you come to him, he wouldn't cast you away, not cast you aside. Ask him to save you. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God has raised him from the dead, the scripture says you will be saved. Put your trust in Jesus. Put your faith in him. Hope in his word. And you can be saved today. Lord, we just thank you for your word and thank you for the gifts that you give us in order to share your word. And we pray all this today in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.